Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for the opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, join you here today. And I, I really, truly do view these as opportunities to be engaged in this kind of a discussion. And I think I might be the first one to be able to, my watch is right, to officially say good afternoon instead of good morning. Um, so I, I do know that I'm between you and uh, lunch today. And you will be pleased to know that I have very few slides. And uh, in my next 10 minutes, which I've been asked to, uh, to limit to, um, I will try and cover off um, what the organizers had asked, which is an introduction to who we are, the role that we play, um, how we engage with patient organizations. And I was also asked to share some best practices around how to engage with uh, private payers. So I'll try to cover that off in the next 10 minutes. So first of all, who are we? Um, CLHA is a not-for-profit trade association that represents 99% of Canada's life and health insurers. And we always leave that 99% to leave a margin of error, just in case there's someone out there that isn't one of our members. But uh, we feel fairly secure that we've covered uh, the marketplace in Canada. Um, we are, um, as I said, a, a voluntary trade association. and. Um, in our role, we actually are um, advocates of areas of interest and importance to our members um, with various stakeholders, government and other stakeholders with patient groups being an important stakeholder in that. We do represent our, um, our members on all services that they provide. So, um, you know, while my team represents uh, health benefits, um, we are a small portion of the overall organization. Um, given the members that we represent. Um, we are uh, a small but mighty organization. We have about 55 individuals with offices in Toronto, where I'm located, as well as in Ottawa, Montreal. Um, and I'm very proud to say that uh, we have been supporting Canadians for a long time. This is our 125th birthday this year. Um, and no, I haven't been there for all 125 years, as old as I am, but uh, I've actually been with the organization for about eight years, but uh, really proud to be celebrating our 125th this year. Um, so private insurers really play a critical role in the provision of health care in Canada. Um, Louise, you mentioned probably 40 to 60% of Canadians that have private insurance, in fact, 26 million Canadians, the majority of Canadians, have access to um, health care supports through private plans that are uh, provided through the employers. And these benefit plans are broad. So while we talk a lot about access to needed medications, which is an important part of a benefit plan, they're also much broader than that and really play an important role in helping patients access care for um, Things like access to health professionals, so physiotherapists and chiropractors for needed care, um, access to dental care, um, access to uh, mental health supports. And so they do play, as I said, a very critical role. And, in, in, you know, in, in the Canadian system, um, many of those um, supports are funded um, in part or not at all through public plans. And so we are a critical part of, of accessing patient care. Um, I put this slide up here because there is a, a myth out there that we hear often that there are less and less Canadians being covered through benefit plans. And in fact, the opposite is true. Um, in the last decade, there has been an increase um, in Canadians covered through workplace plans from 71% to 79%. And so it really demonstrates the value that um, Canadians place on their, their workplace plans. So how do we work with patient organizations at an industry level, and what is our role? So as I said, CLHA, as an association, is um, primarily focused on advocacy with our various stakeholder groups. Um, we facilitate uh, discussions and education and information sharing between our members and stakeholders, such as the patient organizations. We don't, what we don't do is make decisions on products and we don't make decisions on services. So that's the role that our member companies, the insurers, play. So you know, we represent members who are competitors, and so the products that they develop, the services that they provide, are independent decisions made by each insurer. And so 
in our role, um, like I said, we're, we're helping to facilitate that education between the patient organizations, for example, and our members. And we do that often, and we do it in a variety of ways. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate in my role that I've had the opportunity over the last eight years to participate in public forums like this, where there is an opportunity to meet uh, many of you, and, and I see some familiar faces that I've met in other uh, forums, um, and also um, engage in the discussion. And so, you know, that's one of the ways that we do uh, work with patient organizations. We also do it on a, a less public way in that um, we spend a great deal, myself and my team spend a lot of our time meeting with patient organizations and other stakeholders, um, really just between CLHA and, and that organization to help them understand our industry and navigate the system. And so, you know, we're always happy to do that. And, you know, for anybody that's sitting in the room today, if you're representing a patient organization and we haven't chatted, I, I'm pretty sure the organizations, um, I know Louise has it, um, my contact information. And so, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to have you reach out and have that conversation. So um, please take that opportunity. Um, we also, as I said, facilitate discussions. So, um, you know, we're very much focused on education and awareness on behalf of our members. And so, you know, I, I heard earlier the question around consultation and it's not, you know, when we're engaging with a patient organization, it's not so much at an industry level for consultation as it is for that sharing of education and awareness. As I said, we represent competitors. And so, you know, when we're, when we're facilitating this type of dialogue, it's really a two-way street. It's one for you to share, you know, awareness of your organization, some of the issues that are important to you. And it's also an opportunity for um, insurers to ask questions, but also for you to ask questions of them. And so it, it really is intended for that education and awareness. Um, what each of those insurers does with that information um, in terms of their own business is really up to their discretion. Um, but you know, I, I would say this is a, a key part of the focus of my team is working with the various organizations. I'll give you an example where, you know, there's one committee that I'm responsible for um, in terms of managing a group of our members and uh, facilitating that discussion with stakeholders. And, um, you know, September we had a patient organization in. It's a monthly meeting. Um, we have two more patient organizations coming in before the end of the year. And so, you know, it really is a key focus for us in areas of interest to have that dialogue. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at <laughs> how much time I have left. Um, and recognizing everybody's very hungry and tired after the morning, but um, hopefully, I feel like I'm speed talking, but hopefully that's giving you a, a bit of insight into to who we are, um, how we can work together. Um, you know, the one other thing I would say is that we also work on specific issues um, with some organizations in, in areas of interest, right? So I'm looking at Dennis over here, who has facilitated discussions with the industry and, and the rheumatologists over the last several years and, and successfully worked on um, clinical criteria that was consistent across all the insurers. And, you know, over time, we'd hope that there's maybe an opportunity for that criteria to be adopted by public plans as well, so that there's consistency across the, the system. Um, we're now having discussions, again, facilitated um, by Dennis um, with the rheumatologist on renewal criteria. And so, you know, these are real successes and opportunities to work with um, in between your organizations and, and uh, the industry. Um, in terms of best practices, this would be very much a, a personal uh, viewpoint, so I'll, I'll stress that. Um, but it, and it's really based on my experience working with the various stakeholders and working with patient organizations. And I would say it's really coming with a mind to um, collaborating on areas of common interest, um, being open to the discussion, being objective. Um, and that goes for both. Um, the, our, the industry that I represent, as well as the, the stakeholders that we're working with. And I think we've had a lot of success with that, as I said, um, both in the, some of the examples that I've shared here today, but I think you know, we really come from that place of really wanting to work with our various stakeholders and you know, come to a mutually um, successful end that benefits both. So thank you very much for your time. 
Thank you so much, Karen. And we do have about five minutes for any questions or, or comments. Um, I'd like to ask one process question and one substantive question, Karen. Um, I know that uh, your organization was involved in the PharmaCare consultations because I sat in a lot of the same rooms. Um, what do you think about the outcome of the advisory committee's report? It seemed to it seemed to suggest that we're going to move away from private insurance and have a public single-payer national plan. Not in my lifetime, I don't think, but maybe in somebody's. Um, so I wondered if you were, what did, what did your organization think about the outcome of that? And in terms of process, I heard you talk a lot about if you want to talk to us, come and talk to us. But what about the other way around? Like, what about you holding, sort of taking the lead in holding some meetings? I certainly think in oncology, We'd love to have some more conversations with your uh, organization about precision medicine, where it's going, what the impact are uh, will be in the private sphere. Um, what about some kind of a consultation on that sort of thing? Yeah, and some great. Is this on? Uh, yeah, it makes it come closer to it. Okay. Um, great. great questions, and you you never disappoint, Louise. <laughs> So, so I'll maybe take the second one first around, um, you know, why don't we consider this the other way around, right? Instead of patient organizations and the other stakeholders reaching out to us, why don't we reach out to you? Um, and we do some of that as well. So um, it's, it's not that we don't do that. And certainly, you know, I think there's some real opportunities there, and I'll, I'll take that one away, where, you know, maybe I'll circle back to you to find out how would we facilitate something like that, right? Um, between our respective organizations. So, you know, it's a, it's a valid point and a good one and something that, as I said, I'll, I'll take away. In terms of PharmaCare, um, you know, from our industry's perspective, we actually um, see that there are some real opportunities here for change and a need for change, quite frankly. Um, whether we end up, you know, where we end up is anybody's guess at this point. There was the, the report. There's also been an election. We have a minority government. And, you know, we, we have got a, a federal budget earlier this year with the... Um, the Liberals committing funding to things like rare disease drugs and development of the Canadian Drug Agency that was mentioned this morning. So there is some commitment to funding and how that rolls into pharmacare, I guess, is, is for all of us to see as things evolve, right? But we do, as I said, see an opportunity for change. Um, you know, we, we think there's a real opportunity to leverage the strengths of the existing system, quite frankly. Um, and there isn't, you know, without having a need for, you know, blowing up the entire system and massive reform and something that's realistic and sustainable over time. And so, um, you know, an example of that would be leveraging the strengths of um, the PCPA negotiations that are currently for public plans, um, lending our volume to those negotiations through an agency that already exists so that we lower the cost of drugs for all Canadians and improve access through doing that. Um, we also see an opportunity to have a minimum formulary. We, we aren't... Um, seeing this as just a gap-filling exercise, we really do think that there are some opportunities here for greater reform, right? So perhaps, you know, we've talked, there's talk about a minimum formulary. There could be a minimum formulary that all private payers and public payers are required to, um, has as a base to their plan, but are able to offer over and above that. And that would bring some level of consistency to coverage for Canadians. Um, you know, so there's many opportunities. We're really open to working with government um, in developing these solutions, but we think that there's, there's, you know, it would be a shame um, to, you know, as I said earlier, there's the majority of Canadians that are covered through benefit plans today. They value that coverage, and it goes well beyond drug coverage. And um, to take that away would be um, an inefficient way of doing that. Um, leave that coverage where it is, but let's make sure that we also create some equity across the country in terms of coverage and, you know, give those that, that don't have or don't have sufficient access to that coverage as well. That was the perfect segue to my question, actually. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask about mental health. You mentioned um, services that are covering mental health. I cannot speak for other provinces in Alberta. There is not a lot of, in, unless you are in a very big company group package, if you are with, let's say, um, Alberta Blue Cross, or if you are in a basic plans, 
the services for mental health that are covered are very, very basic, if any. So I guess it's a two-folded question. One, are you guys aware of this? And is, has this been brought to your attention? And two, if that's the case, are you, are you looking into this? So, I, I, good question. And, and I guess the first thing, you know, just, just a reminder that I'm, I'm um, representing private payers, so I can't talk to coverage provided through a public system, right? Um, but from a private payer perspective, um, these are plans that are purchased by an employer, so it is going to vary. But I would say as an industry and through private plans, there is, um, you know, there's, there's always room to improve. Uh, no doubt, and mental health is an important issue for our industry, but certainly there are a lot of supports that I'm aware of that are being provided through many of the benefit plans today. Um, and it takes, you know, multiple um, levels of coverage. So, you know, it, it might be access to the medication, it might be access to services of a psychotherapist or a psychologist, right? So these are things that are, are covered. Now, again, it's going to vary because it's an employer offered plan, right? But many of the plans do provide access to this kind of care. In addition to that, uh, many plans have disability coverage. So if someone is suffering from a mental illness and is not able to work, um, there is disability coverage that is available through many of the, the plans. And one of the other things um, that's covered pretty consistently now through benefit plans is access to CBT. So, you know, with the, where you can get the 24-7 coverage. And that's, that's becoming pretty um, standard in terms of benefit plans and access to that. So it's sort of expanding your ability to access um, the care. So, you know, like I said, there's, there's always certainly room for improvement, but I think we feel as an industry that, you know, there, there is a lot being done, more that can be done for sure, um, but it, it takes, you know, there's various levels, so it's not one bucket, it's, it's through various parts of the, the benefit plan. Thank you so much to Karen and to all of you again for your fantastic questions.